Welcome to the Water Resources Podcast. I'm your host, Bridget Scanlon, from the Bureau of Economic Geology at the University of Texas at Austin. This podcast is produced in partnership with the National Academy of Engineering. In this podcast, we discuss water challenges with leading experts. Today, I am pleased to welcome my friend Chung Mao Zheng uh, to the Water Resources Podcast. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Chung Mao, for uh, joining me today. Um, Maybe you can describe a little bit about your recent uh, positions because it's kind of hard to keep up with you. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Bridget. I'm very happy to be here. And I went to University of Wisconsin Madison for my PhD uh, quite a few years ago. And then I uh, returned to, to China to take up a position at the Peking University. And then I moved to a thousand University of Science and Technology in Shenzhen, China, to actually to start a, a school of environmental science and engineering uh, in 2015. And I'm still associated with uh, uh, that university, uh, referred to as SASTEC. But uh, since last year, I'm actually, uh, again, uh, starting an, a new university, private, privately funded university called uh, uh, Eastern Institute of Technology uh, in Ningbo, uh, Zhejiang province. Uh, I'm a, a chair professor and vice president of the new startup university. So it's been a long way uh, since my Wisconsin days. Yeah, yeah that's uh, really also exciting. My, my research, uh, my, my research uh, interest uh, mainly is related to groundwater and hydrogeology and including like eco-hydrological process and groundwater pollution and remediation and also the how uh, global change and, and emerging contaminant, contaminant impacting uh, groundwater sustainability. Yeah, Bridget. Right. Thank you so much, uh, Mao. And uh, the new university at Ningbo sounds very exciting. It, uh, and it's uh, science and technology. So it will sort of be like uh, the MIT of uh, China, I guess. Uh, um, yeah, that's, that's the hope. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe someday. That's, that's uh, a huge uh, endeavor. Um, and of course, uh, China, or I mean, Chen Mao is an internationally recognized hydrogeologist and has won numerous awards uh, and was selected as the Geological Society of America, Birds All Dries, Distinguished Lecturer, and also an AG, uh, American Geophysical Union Fellow. Um, so I really appreciate your taking the time out of your busy schedule uh, to talk today. And um, there's a lot of interest uh, uh, in water resources in China and also how it's responding to climate impacts and land use change and things like that. So today uh, we'll cover those uh, general topics about the spatial distribution of water. You have uh, water uh, scarce in the, uh, in the north and water rich in the south. And uh, then the response to floods and droughts that we hear about and how you manage those and then solutions to the water issues, uh, um, storing more water, transporting water from rich to poor areas, and, uh, and then the impacts of development on pollution and how you're managing that. So we'll try to cover, um, do a sort of a reconnaissance on many of those things. Before we talk about uh, the details, and maybe it'd be nice, uh, Chuma, if you gave us a little bit of background on China, you know, the population and how it com and the area and things like that, and the distribution of water in the country. Yeah, uh, Bridget. And, and China uh, has a population of about uh, 1.4 billion, uh, similar to, to India, and uh, compared to uh, more than uh, 300. Uh, million in the U.S. and, and uh, uh, but uh, China Chinese population uh, stopped growing. I think the first time last year. I think almost reaching the plateau. So this is uh, uh, quite a, a, a event uh, last year. A lot of people paying attention to like uh, uh, China population stopped growing after many many years of rapid growth, and uh, and China total area is about. Uh, 9.6 million kilometers square, uh, quite similar to Canada and US. Now, uh, you talk about uh, China uh, being uh, 
a tale of uh, two halves, very, very much so in terms of uh, uh, water resources. Uh, and then no, uh, now if, if we divide almost half, half, uh, North China and South China, uh, North China, the average precipitation is uh, uh, actually less than 200 millimeter uh, or equal, equal to eight inch while South it's greater than uh, 1600 millimeter, um, which is uh, 64 inch. So uh, water resource per capita in the north versus south is one to four. So you can see that's really uh, very uh, significant. And in terms of uh, uh, China, you mentioned this is an extreme event uh, and then China really experienced a climatic and, and hydrologic streams for sure. I, I just uh, last two, uh, two weeks ago, I, I, I went to Xi'an, which is uh, Western uh, China. Normally this time of year, the temperature should be quite mild. But when I was there, it's almost like, uh, I think it's closer to 100 Fahrenheit, which is quite unusual. And, and, and also Beijing, the capital, uh, has experienced the hottest summer ever. I think similar like many other places, and with multiple days exceeding 100 degrees. Uh, so, you, you know, uh, it, it also that's temperature, but in terms of uh, uh, water uh, extreme, hydrologic extreme, uh, North China is much better known for water scarcity and, and water shortage. I, I gave uh, many talk about China's water crisis, water shortage in North China plan. But flooding has become uh, a lot more frequent. Uh, just uh, a couple years ago, a couple of weeks ago, actually, uh, actually late July, I think, you might have heard the Beijing area encountered, I think, uh, once a uh, hundred year flooding event with a dozen pe uh, people uh, uh, die from. It. So it's, uh, uh, this has become a lot more frequent. Uh, so the, you, you, you can really uh, see the, uh, uh, this in intensifying in terms of extreme event extreme hydrologic uh, responses. Yeah, right. Please. Yeah. And and I was reading uh, some insurance reports, Aon Insurance said that in 2022, uh, they mentioned that um, the economic losses from flooding in China was uh, totaled about 15 billion uh, with a mortality of about 200 people and uh, 8 billion from droughts. Uh, so it's... Uh, similar to many regions is trying to manage it's very challenging for water resources managers to to deal with these extremes um i think the world bank uh, i remember them saying a couple of years ago it's the case of too much uh, too little and too polluted uh so um but but you are tackling some of these issues now in china you you know you mentioned the, the southern half and the northern half and i guess the divide is uh, the division between the Yangtze River and uh, the uh, Yellow River, uh, the, those basin boundaries. Yes, yes. Um, uh, so even way back in the 50s, uh, Mao Zedong was talking about uh, trying to move water from the water-rich south to the water-poor north. And so you guys have been doing that with the south to north uh, water transfer project. Maybe you can describe that a little bit, uh, Chen Mao. Yeah, yeah. Uh... So this is also uh, related to uh, a three gorge project, right? It, it's a related to, uh, I, I, I should uh, point out that the uh, uh, drought and, and flood has been a problem for uh, thousands of years in, in China. China really suffers from a lot of uh, natural disasters from uh, water. And the too little, too much, and, and too polluted really is a good summary of uh, all the challenges uh, facing China. So uh, uh, the three gold, uh, three uh, gold project, I think, was actually uh, first priority was to regulate uh, flooding, try to 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 pre prevent uh, more flooding, to regulate the water storage upstream. Uh, and they also obviously generate the clean clean uh, energy, hydropower, reduce the CO two, uh, 
And then uh, that relate to that project is this water transfer. Uh, you mentioned the Mao Zedong started talking about back in 1950s. And, and, and so after many, many years of uh, debate and, and discussion and, and on and off, finally it started more than uh, 10 years ago. And, and the, the, the project was designed uh, to, to transfer like uh, 45 billion cubic meter from Yangtze River uh, to North China uh, by 2050. So it's still a uh, few years to, to go at the total cost of uh, 60 billion US dollar. So that's a, a lot of money. And the, the, the project has uh, three routes. Uh, Eastern and middle has been largely completed and sending uh, billions of uh, cubic uh, meter world to North China. And, and then uh, so far, uh, I think uh, a lot of people, tens of million people have benefited from it. Uh, it's really because uh, uh, North, North China uh, suffers very significant water shortage. Uh, and, and then uh, uh, with, with, it, with this completion of the Middle and Eastern uh, route, and uh, groundwater uh, has been recovering groundwater level because due to over years of over pumping in North China plain and right now have been, been recovering. And, and, but there are also some problems. For example, the Eastern route uh, needs uh, like a total of 65 meters lift from Yangtze River pump station. So a lot of energy uh, is, is needed. Uh, and also, the 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 uh, transfer canal go through many uh, uh, population center, uh, so you have to do a lot of engineering measures to prevent the pollution, polluted water in, from infiltrating into a transfer canal, and also now with the groundwater recovery in the North China Plain, the the, the the potential for significant water quality change. So that that that's an, another something they have to to to, to worry about. Now, uh, with the most controversy is the western route, which is still under planning, still uh, uh, in a planning stage. It, it's much more difficult to build uh, to do in uh, with the western route because the geological condition very uh, difficult. Very a lot of uh, fault fracture zones, and also uh, biodiversity concerns, ecological conservation, and, and, and also much higher lift would be needed, like between 80 to 500 from uh, uh, intake to final desolation. So there's a lot of uh, uh, difficulty still, but yeah, they're still dis discussing, yeah. It's, it's quite an engineering feat, isn't it? And uh, as you describe uh, this uh, South to North water transport project, um, transfer project, I mean, you're describing the trade-offs, uh, uh, you know, moving water and providing water. One thing we could do is we could move the people. We rarely move people to where the water is, um, but uh, moving the water then and the energy required to move that uh, and so you mentioned the three routes, the Eastern, Central, and Western. So the Eastern route, does that end in Tianjin? Uh, and how much water does it transfer? About one cubic kilometer per year, is that correct? Or It's about uh, uh, one, uh, let's see, total is uh, 45, so about 10 billion. Uh, 10 billion. Cubic, well, 10 billion. Right. Uh, so right. all together, Eastern and, and, and Middle, I think all together close to like uh, 20 billion. Right, right. And and so for our listeners, then uh, 1 billion cubic meters is the same as one cubic kilometer of water and yes. is, uh, is similar to 1 million acre feet. 1.2 okay. cubic kilometers, 1 million acre feet. So it's similar to million acre feet. So this mm. is a lot of water when you consider... You know, uh, in some of your graphics in your papers, you showed that from the 1950s to recent, the water, the use in China has gone from about 100 cubic kilometers to about 500 uh, cubic kilometers. So this water transfer is a significant part of uh, the um, substantial part of the total water use in China. So uh, it helps a lot. 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, I, 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 if I'm correct, I think uh, by like uh, 2014, uh, in, in entire Lord China Plain, uh, groundwater uh, has been the water table has been dropping like uh, average like uh, four point four five meter a year. That's almost half meter, very significant. And then uh, since the transfer, water transfer, and also due to uh, some other factors, for example, uh, uh, Lord China has been a little bit wetter, wet more more rainfall last couple of years. So the recovery has been almost half that amount, like uh, 0.2 or 0.3, between 0.2 to 3 per year. So it's a fairly significant recovery. And then and, and, uh, I heard, I, I read somewhere like uh, uh, 60 million or, or something like a huge, large population uh, benefiting using the water. Uh, Right, right. So, so the North China Plain is the region around uh, Beijing and Tianjin, very popul high population density, and then a lot of uh, irrigated agriculture. And yeah. it seems like uh, way back um, several decades ago, uh, they um, dammed up many of the rivers that were coming into the North China Plain. And then so the irrigation then depends primarily on groundwater. And um, food security was a big, uh, a large goal for China for many, many years. And uh, so they grow wheat and, and maize. So um, winter wheat, uh, when you have very little rainfall, and so you rely heavily on irrigation and, and summer maize, uh, which is during the rainy season. And so that requires less irrigation. So this heavy dependence on groundwater uh, for irrigation led to a lot of depletion in addition to the large municipalities. So does the south to north water transfer, does that transfer water mostly to the municipalities and then by um, reducing groundwater use for those municipalities, then the, the, the groundwater in the uh, North China Plain aquifer has been recovering. Is that correct or is it also helping with irrigation? Yeah, uh, I think uh, the the transfer water mostly for or for like for example for Beijing city for for domestic use, and that in turn uh, reduce the need for pump uh, for 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 uh, domestic use, and and so uh, groundwater is recovery, but most of the transfer water is for 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 domestic use for drinking water, but if uh, excessive. Uh, over surplus will be discharged to to our aquifer. Yeah. Some right. Right. Yeah. Um. So so that has been a huge help. So maybe your two thousand nine Burzal Dries lecture, uh, where you, the title was "Will China Run Out of Water?" So it has been trying to manage these issues then with the storing more water to alleviate floods, but also uh, that water can be used during drought periods. So. The Three Gorges, uh, I think that is about uh, 39 cubic kilometers of water stored uh, capacity mm. in the mm. Three Gorges. Uh, and so if you can store that uh, uh, from the wet periods uh, and then use it more for the dry periods, that can help uh, yeah. adapt to these uh, climate extremes also. Right, yes. Um, and uh, then, so storing water and transporting water, these are all different engineering solutions uh, to try to manage water resources. Um, and you have done um, a large, uh, I mean, irrigation globally is the elephant in the room in terms of water use. And so also in China, in the North China Plain, irrigated agriculture. Um, but you've been working with some colleagues, uh, Professor Kinzebach and others, uh, trying to manage irrigation water use in the North China Plain and make it more efficient. And also with that is the fertilizer applications. Uh, so that has helped increase productivity. But uh, um, maybe you can describe a little bit about uh, uh, the work that uh, Professor Kinzebach and uh, you have been discussing recently. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I know you've done a, a great deal of research on irrigation. So the, the 
part of a problem for North China Pan is it's also very important for uh, food production, uh, also food basket, uh, so-called for, for China. So a lot of uh, it, water, uh, over 60% uh, uh, North China Pan used for irrigation. And so, the, but at the same time, uh, we talk about water security, food security is very important too. Uh, actually, China, uh, the, the cultivated land only about uh, 9% of the total in the world. And, and the water resource about 7% uh, of the world. But the population, as I mentioned at the beginning, it's almost like one fifth, like 18% or something. So as you can see, it's really hard to, to produce enough food to feed uh, the, the such a large population. So China now, uh, solving some of the problem, a water problem by importing some food. Actually, the latest statistic is the 1 million pounds of food right now, I think last year, uh, mainly soybeans. And, uh, and to produce that amount of water, actually, uh, that amount of food, uh, 100 billion cubic meter of water will be needed. To, to produce that imported food. Uh, but China does not have that much water. So this is really good uh, uh, illustration of food water nexus that you study uh, so much. And now come back to North China Plain. North China Plain, uh, groundwater recover someone in, in addition uh, to that the water transfer. And other things also, the, uh, reduction in the, in the food production because it, you use real depending on the uh, import so so uh, now increase the irrigation uh, efficiency it's quite important for for water saving and water con conserv conservation and professor Kinzerbeck, I uh, professor Kinzerbeck from ETH I known professor Kinzerbeck for many years as I have known you many years and he, he has done some wonderful things uh, to promote groundwater sustainability, uh, using Lord China as a big dog. Uh, and and, and uh, uh, in, in Lord China plan, at the worst of uh, this overdraft, over pumping, uh, uh, water table uh, like uh, dropped like 50, uh, 60 meter or even more below land surface. Normally without Normally, before pumping, that's like oh, two or three or four meter below land surface. So very dramatic, uh, just a uh, uh, drop water table. And actually, you can 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 see from the satellite. And uh, Professor Kinzerbeck team, uh, supported by Swiss government and also assisted by Chinese Ministry of Water Resource, conduct a very comprehensive project uh, to test and implement groundwater management, water saving policy. And, and so they uh, use a lot of sensors and also uh, sometimes hard to, 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 to get the data of like pump, uh, farmers won't tell you. So they use the uh, electric, electricity consumption and relate that to pumping. It's a, it's a good, 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 very good idea. And then they, they developed the cutting edge groundwater models. And then uh, based on how much you pump and how, Groundwater system will respond, and then design the uh, support uh, system, decision support system to tell farmers uh, when to irrigate, uh, when what type of uh, uh, crop may be better for them, or uh, use less water, and depending on how much water they have, uh, some also water price, so so say or uh, be more beneficial to go for another uh, crop and so so on. So the, the whole system, I think, uh, it'd be very. It's quite quite uh, innovative and useful, and definitely going to help uh, moving this uh, uh, water management forward. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's uh, really um, very important to, to work directly with the farmers who are the stakeholders and and help them understand the resource and the dynamics of the resource. Uh, and so these approaches that uh, Professor Kinzebach has uh, promoted and, and developed uh, working with them and translating the, the results from the detailed groundwater modeling to decision support 
uh, that is really incredible and uh, really helps develop more sustainable uh, management. So, so you mentioned, you know, maybe China has relaxed a little bit on its uh, providing food security by production in China alone, and then is um, importing more food from other countries. Mm. I was looking last year at, you know, maybe importing from Brazil, 30 bi 33 billion, the US $25 billion, um, and Thailand 10 billion, and uh, Australia 7 billion. So a lot of uh, food imports then, and you mentioned mostly soybean, and so that, mm -hmm. that helps. But I'm wondering, you know, with the economic development in China, you're now considered uh, upper middle income country, you know, and changing diets. If the import is really uh, getting you ahead of the game, or you're just keeping pace with the, the increased water footprint uh, for the, the changing diets with maybe more Western type diets or things like that. So it's really hard to get ahead um, when, when be human behavior changes uh, in response to economic development. Um, yeah, that, that 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 that's very true. I think you. Uh, it's a very good point that uh, I think the like meat consumption has really going up in China uh, as uh, uh, people get the wealthier and and uh, income increase. Uh, so that yeah, uh, how 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 are we going to keep pace with the, the with that? Uh, I'm not so sure. But another thing, though, we could also rely on go shipped to like. Uh, 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 artificial meat. Actually, my my uh, my research team is uh, it's working. It's just submitting a paper on how that will actually improve, contribute to uh, sustainability uh, by uh, shifting from real meat to to a, a, a human made. Right, right, yeah. and uh, you know, some people say I, I can remember some people from the British Geological Survey, a woman that had uh, stage four cancer and. She was wondering why the Chinese had uh, maybe a decade or so ago had uh, so little cancer and she attributed it to uh, dairy free diets. And so she was mm. promoting that and she wrote some books on that for trying to um, prevent or uh, deal with uh, cancer uh, issues. So it's all very interesting. Uh, so uh, one of the things that's maybe a little bit different uh, about uh, China versus other countries is that, uh, you know, you, ha you have an opportunity to do more top-down management, uh, but maybe you can describe the water governance a little bit and how that is distributed among the different ministries and how you really would like to see more coordination uh, to improve that. Yeah, I think, uh, uh, Bridget, you, you touch up on a very important issue uh, about the governance. About uh, So every whenever people discuss the water issue in China, this, this topic will come up, the so-called Lion Dragon rule of the water, right? You, you heard in Chinese, it's a Jiu Long Zhi Shui. It's equivalent to a US uh, uh, English saying that too many cooks spoil the broth. So that, that being, but I, so that's a very uh, big problem and we were talking about it for, for a long time. But I, I can say there have been some improvement in coordination. Uh, for example, uh, the function of groundwater, uh, groundwater pollution control has been moved to a Ministry of Ecology and Environment since the ministry was reorganized back in 2018. Uh, in the past, it was in the, uh, jurisdiction of other ministries, like uh, Ministry of uh, Natural Resources. So that actually significant help a lot of groundwater. I just gave a, a, a talk at the conference all organized by, by, by Ministry of uh, Ecology and Environment. And another example is a release in November 2021, uh, signed by former Premier Li Keqiang the regulation on groundwater management. I think uh, I published a letter to the editor of science. The legislation actually uh, really was created to address the uh, groundwater related issues more comprehensively and explicitly, uh, including this uh, division and, uh, and, and make sure that each uh, ministries, each 
uh, department uh, will know their responsibilities and will uh, do the uh, coordination. So that that's a, a, a regulation. I think it's a, it's a very significant one. Uh, and that's why we, I, I send this letter to 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 science. Uh, so that the the people I think the, the, uh, things are moving in the right direction, but still, uh, still it's a complicated situation. Yeah. Well, I mean, we have the same issues in in the U.S. and 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 I think in yeah. many regions, you know, surface water is regulated separately from groundwater, oftentimes, and so they sometimes double count the water and they don't acknowledge the connection between the two. And so, I think it's very important to consider these. So, if you're developing a solution for one area, that you're not hmm. nuking another area in the process yeah. uh, and an unintended consequence. So. When we look at uh, energy issues or food issues, you know, we might improve the situation for those uh, sectors, but we might be uh, degrading uh, water uh, quality or quantity, those sorts of things. Um, you've done a lot of work in in uh, the high, uh, uh, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that uh, correctly, uh, basin in Northwest uh, China uh, and uh, looking at uh, the water issues there and developing an integrated uh, water resources uh, modeling approach and and considering stakeholders. I really like the comprehensive approach that you bring to these things, where you consider you know food production, ecosystems, and surface water and groundwater uh, connectivity. Uh, maybe uh, and this was heavily funded by the government. Can you describe that a little bit and how you whether you feel like they have met, they met the goals of the project or how it evolved. Yeah, th thank you, Bridget, uh, for uh, bringing this up. I, I was very fortunate to be involved in this uh, project. That, uh, the, I think, the one of the major uh, things I, I, I did after I came to China, to work in China. So uh, Chinese National Science Foundation, they would fund this large research program for over eight years. So you actually can really do something over a year, and then uh, uh, any research group can apply to to this program for funding. So, and, and I, I I I was part of the steering committee uh, to 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 kind of to guide advise the program, and, and the name is integrated uh, ecological hydrological study of the Heihe River Basin. Uh, hey, hey, her. It's mean a black river. So hey, her. Uh, it, it, it's really it's a good example of uh, 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 the conflict between uh, like a human need for irrigation and the natural, na nature need uh, conservation for 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 nature uh, uh, vegetation. So it's uh, and then there's, there's a, a lot of uh, uh, arid, semi-arid. Uh, in Ch land in China, this is in in northwest China, and so in in this is quite typical this uh, uh, inland river basin. So the all the water flow, most of flow, uh, water resource generate upstream uh, from the, uh, high altitude mountain region with slow uh, permafrost glacial melting. Actually, the water resource has been increasing the upstream uh, due to climate warming. Quite quite significant. You can see the the melting uh, of a uh, glacial and thawing of permafrost, and then the middle stream is very dry. But a lot of agriculture it's a, it's it's a, it's a plain area. So so uh, water from all upstream usually used overused, leaving very little for for downstream. But downstream using there's a terminal lake, and then along the, and the river as an important oasis. Uh, uh, ecosystem functioning. So uh, the, for, this is the same story in China, many uh, uh, basins, inland river basins. So, so, so uh, downstream uh, significant desertification and drying up of terminal lake. So the Heihe, Heihe River Basin was selected to, for, this, for this major study. And, and then uh, uh, to kind of uh, uh, the advise government how to uh, uh, set, how much water environmental flow should be uh, allowed to go downstream 
for 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 ecological conservation. So in this project, we have more than hundred projects, and then we study so uh, and do a lot of integrated modeling observation, and and, and then. Uh, and we, 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 the major conclusion is that it's possible to, to utilize the storage regulation function of particular aquifer in the middle stream. And so you, uh, you, you, during the wet, wet season, you try to use more surface water and, and use groundwater aquifer as storage and open that groundwater reservoir. And then when the dry season, then you, you pump the water out. Okay, so in this way, you can preserve, you can, save enough water for, for, for downstream. So we, we, we actually, our result helped the government managers to modify the existing water sharing contact the agreement between uh, middle stream and downstream communities. So that, so that was uh, uh, one important outcome from, from us. But it, it seems that uh, just that the runoff still depend on local climate change because uh, Last few years have been relatively wet, so quite a lot of water. So there's no problem uh, give saving enough water for downstream. And that the terminal lake, it's called Juyang Lake, has really uh, plenty of water and, and then the uh, vegetation area quite expanded, quite significant. And, but the last couple of years actually uh, become kind of this seem like a trend to go to a, a, a dry air, a dry years again. So the, 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 actually the water uh, had been reduced to a, a to downstream. And also there's another unforeseen consequences in, in those wet years, when there's plenty of water going to downstream, the, the purpose was to, to, to uh, improve, to enhance the, the vegetation, to, to preserve the, uh, terminal lake, but the farmers would be was happy to take the water to grow like melon or, or economic crop uh, crops. So uh, and defeating the, the purpose. So it does, you have really complicated the ledger and the human factors uh, in this uh, water management. Right, right. So I mean, this project really encompasses a lot of different issues. You know. Uh, so this internally draining system uh, with a terminal lake, Indoraic mm. Basin, um, and then the water supply from the mountains and then the increased water supply related to uh, melting glaciers and permafrost and um, and then the um, how much water to allocate to human water use uh, versus uh, uh, e ecosystems. Uh, that's a real challenge. And then uh, dealing with wet and dry climate cycles, you know, and human behavior responding to those. And you can't really ratchet it back as quickly when you get a dry period, uh, you know, based on what you've developed during a wet period. But I like what you mentioned about the conjunctive use of surface water and groundwater. I think that is so important. And I mean, we do that in California, they go from like 70% surface water use during wet periods to 70% groundwater uh, during dry periods. And people complain about the shift to, to groundwater during the, the droughts and stuff. But if we didn't use the surface water, we'd be in much worse shape, you know. Mm -hmm. But having irrigation systems and infrastructure that can uh, source water from surface water and groundwater uh, is oftentimes not available. So people either do one or the other. So um, taking advantage of those wet periods and surface water availability and then shifting to groundwater, I think that is fantastic. And we need much more conjunct management of surface water and groundwater. So yeah. another aspect, and maybe shift a little bit, uh, Chamao, uh, we talk a lot about climate impacts, uh, floods and droughts and climate change and stuff. But another aspect is land use impact on water resources. And um, uh, China has also done large scale experiment with land use uh, in the Los Plateau, where you were trying to reduce uh, sediment load maybe to the Yellow River or things like that. And the reforestation in the Los Plateau, maybe you can describe that a little bit, uh, Chamao, and uh, what the, the results of that and what the impacts on water were. 
Yeah, the, the, uh, Bridge, this, this is the interesting uh, talk about land, land use change. I, I think China uh, really did uh, a huge grand experiment in this. Uh, back in 1999, uh, they started a so-called Grain for Green uh, a program at a large scale, first in a, a, a Los, a Los Plateau, and later on expand to uh, many other parts of China. So just looking at the Los Plateau, you know, the, the, that's the source region for Yellow River. So very significant sediment, uh, soil erosion, and then sediment uh, are going to uh, uh, Yellow River. That's why Yellow River keep going up because so much uh, sediment. Uh, and people try to, to, to uh, bank and then build up. And, and then the, uh, with this program, so the uh, government pay farmers to stop uh, farming and then uh, grow the, uh, 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 the vegetation. And when this program started, in 1999, the vegetation coverage at the 32% for, for Los Plateau. Now, like last year, it'd be like 64%, so almost double. So, and the impact on the sediment is even more dramatic because the sediment now at the for Yellow River is at 0.2 uh, gigaton, billion uh, ton, gig gigaton, which is a historical low. Um, dating all the way back to uh, a Tang, uh, Tang Dynasty a thousand years ago. So it's really, really low now. Uh, and, and actually, so low people are starting to worry about it. just too little sediment uh, in, in, in and actually a high level of this sediment is for comparison is the 1.6 uh, gigaton. So it's a how many fold of uh, uh, decrease. But that's a, that's a a concern now with this too much coverage of vegetation too green because uh, that lead to a, a kind of reduction in runoff. Uh, so the study have showed that the surface water runoff uh, versus precipitation uh, was about eight uh, percent surface runoff versus uh, precipitation. Between 1980 to 1999, that is before this program, green, uh, grain for green, now reduced to five percent between 2000 and 2010. So that's uh, that's fairly significant, almost half uh, uh, decrease. And some area, uh, actually, the run surface runoff reduced by as much as fifty percent because uh, of ET increasing. Uh, by through about four or five millimeters, so that, so you, so you see there's this a lot of uh, factors involved. You you do you want to green, but you have to worry about the sediment. You have to worry about the uh, too too little sediment or too little water resource. So 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 also based on my own study in our paper actually bridge our co-authors paper on the China's. Uh, a groundwater model for national nation uh, nation scale. Actually, we calculate like a, a reduction of base flow to Yellow River for twenty three percent over the last seventy five years. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's more than this green for uh, green for green program, but many other factors. But it's very significant decrease in groundwater uh, base flow. Right. So, yeah. For, for the reason I just discussed, that some people have actually advocated for stopping the Grain for Green program, but I think it's it's not has not been stopped or it's continued because uh, a lot of uh, complicated. Right, right. So, so the grains that were being grown in the Los Plateau were mostly like wheat and maize or things like that. Uh, and then was it for, were replaced by forest or was it replaced yeah, forest, by forest? They simply stopped the. Uh, uh, farming and and just uh, let the reforest or planting of trees. Right, right. And so with the planting of trees, then you you're replacing short rooted uh, crops uh, with deep rooted trees, and so that will reduce the recharge also to the underlying aquifer. And then, as you mentioned, then 
uh, groundwater discharges to streams and that's the base flow component and that yeah. um, uh, being reduced also. So with deeper rooted trees replacing shallow rooted crops and when you get rid of the fallow period from cropping where you have no evaporation of the water uh, when you don't have any crops growing, you know, a lot of those things, you know, you're changing the whole water cycle in that region. And then mm. the impacts then are groundwater recharge, runoff and sediment yield and all of these different things. So it's difficult sometimes to anticipate all of the effects of one change. Um, but I mean, what you describe there is a little bit similar to what um, maybe in the Midwest that they're proposing for biofuel uh, production. Mm you know, where they're saying go from uh, grain production to deep rooted switchgrass or perennial grasses. And so you would change the water cycle, you know, you would change the recharge, change the runoff, uh, change the base flow to the streams. Uh, and so we need to consider all of those things when we promote some of these uh, programs. Um, and, um, and, and lastly, I think, you know, another aspect of, that you have been working on is the Tibetan plateau and, and these Asian water towers. Um, so these are uh, huge uh, sources of water and they're being impacted a lot by uh, climate change. Uh, maybe you can describe the groundwater impacts of uh, uh, the changes that you've been seeing in the last couple of decades in that region. Yeah. Uh, I, I've been uh, lucky to also serve on this uh, another this uh, research program on the com steering committee. So uh, my, I spent most of my research time on the two committees, uh, two programs. This one focused on the impact of climate change on water resource and adaptive management in, in Qinghai Tibet Plateau. And so again, we have a lot of people involved. My uh, own research group more focused on the ground water. So the, the Tibetan plateau is, is the source region, uh, just for background, for several very large Asian rivers, including in China, the Yellow River, Yangtze River, and Mekong River. So uh, it has the largest store of frozen water uh, after the polar region. So it's been referred to as a third pole, and it's providing a critical water supply to uh, 2 billion people. Okay, so so let's uh, refer to, uh, as the Asian water tower, and and that this region is very sensitive to climate change. Actually, uh, during eight, 1980 to 2018, so those 18, uh, 30, 40, almost 40 years, and, and the warming of uh, uh, this region about uh, 0.42 degree uh, uh, Celsius per decade. So that's about twice of global change. So it's very significant intense warming has led to a large extensive glacial retreat and also the perma permafrost thawing. So we have actually done some modeling and then um, prediction some of how the perma permanent permafrost might disappear in one year. I don't, anyway, it's just very, very quick and so, and and also the the uh, thawing of this the permafrost and glacier need to, needing to a very large lake expansion in plateau, uh, and 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 so, so this this is uh, the area with a very little uh, observation, and and because it's difficult to to get to, uh, and so. Uh, we, we see that we really need uh, more, more, more observation, more, more monitoring network, and then uh, uh, put everything together and and and, and using like uh, relate to a, a remote sensing product such as Grace, and then doing some uh, earth system modeling and which is kind of ongoing. But it, it's very uh, exciting area, uh, maybe the last frontier to. For, for for groundwater research in this type of region, yeah. 
Um, so that's fascinating. And then this expansion of lakes and, of course, the value of remote sensing, then to see a lot of these things happening in areas yeah. where you can't uh, uh, do it on the ground as readily. Um, and I, I know it, has been, it hasn't been fair on you that uh, I have I've been asking you questions about a lot of uh, different things, but you've been involved in so many different projects, but you're really your passion seems to be water quality, water pollution, and uh, China has uh, been heavily industrialized and a lot of the economic development has benefited from that. Um, and I guess now you are trying to help with the remediation of uh, much of this pollution and uh, maybe you can describe some efforts on that front, wastewater treatment and, and things like that, um, Chambao. Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, 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 quickly. Yeah, when I first uh, came to work in China, I was uh, thinking that I will work on groundwater uh, pollution control remediation. But at that time, uh, more than 10 years ago, or 15 years ago, that, that really uh, the country was more concerned with like uh, surface water pollution and, and or air pollution and did not get to uh, groundwater pollution uh, much later. Uh, so, uh, when I started working here, the, the pollution really was very per pervasive, widespread. Uh, as you also know, when coming to China to visit, uh, water, air, soil. But China, China uh, with the economic uh, development, also the uh, uh, becoming a second uh, economy, large, largest economy in the world. So enough uh, resources to actually work to fix some of the pollution problem. So China invested uh, hundreds of billions of US dollars to address those problems. And, and, and particularly, uh, I, I should mention those uh, are three uh, regulations, very important, referred as the uh, water tank plan. So there's 10 regulations for fixing water pollution and then the air tank uh, for air pollution, air tank plan and soil tank plan. So those three refer to an action plan, three for water, for air, for, for soil. So the uh, improvement to surface water quality, air quality has been quite dramatic as you uh, can uh, know about it, but read about it, right? It's very easy to see because you can see the air, you can see the surface water. Uh, I just give you an example. When I came to work in Shenzhen uh, 2015, at Southern University of Science Technology, almost all 300 stream and little tributaries for, for Shenzhen were heavily polluted. And, and then the water quality all grade five, the worst kind, grade from one being best, five to worst. And then uh, a lot of uh, rivers are recalled, uh, black and smelly water body because when you walk over, you can smell and see the black. And at that time, like the Shenzhen government uh, uh, started the initiative with a total investment of uh, uh, 10 billion US dollars. Uh, and to fix just for that purpose, to, to fix surface water quality. And right now it's been really uh, uh, much, much improved in, in all those black and smelly water bodies that uh, disappeared. Uh, but uh, I, I have become my uh, uh, true passion is <laughs> groundwater, right? So, so the groundwater contamination pollution take much longer to fix uh, for a reason. It's more expensive. You cannot see them. You have a lot of data it's hard to collect. And groundwater simply uh, it's much more difficult, expensive to, to, cre to clear. And uh, for now, even last year, the latest report, 61% of all groundwater monitoring points are grade four or five on a scale of one to five. So four or five are, are, are worst or, or very, very, very bad. So, so, so that there's a very formidable challenge ahead for fixing groundwater pollution in China. Uh, but fortunately, China has realized the importance of soil and, and groundwater pollution control. So it's treating it as a priority. I just give you an example. I, I have given three top presentations at the, uh, since April on three conference, uh, nationwide conference meetings on this topic. Uh, so 
it certainly the groundwater pollution is getting a lot of attention. You know? And right. so water quality and quantity obviously go hand in hand. So whatever we can do to improve uh, water quality, they help with uh, uh, water sustainability. Right, right. Um, I was reading uh, a new World Bank report that came out um, uh, not so long ago about um, uh, groundwater and you know how it's a hidden resource and stuff. But one of the concepts that was mentioned in that report was uh, a weak sustainability approach that economists talk about, uh, that uh, you have to develop uh, economically first, and then you may overuse uh, resources or pollute or something, but then you will have the economic resources to address those issues uh, later. So they, they use the term weak sustainability. So I don't know if you think that that applies to China. And I mean, you have, China has come a long way with uh, award, another World Bank report stating that uh, 800 million people came out of extreme poverty in China uh, from the uh, development there. And some of that was uh, agricultural development, irrigation and fertilizer, and then industrial development. So all of these have helped to bring people out of poverty. Uh, but maybe in the process, then uh, the resources have been degraded. And maybe now you have the financial resources to address uh, those uh, problems, but uh, sometimes it takes a lot of time. Yeah, uh, uh, Bridget, I, I, I like the concept. Uh, I, I, th I think uh, what the, I've seen in China is, is quite uh, followed that, 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 uh, the concept. That because uh, we all talk about uh, preventing pollution before it being polluted, but, uh, but most people, I think the countries, the poor country or developing countries, they have to develop their economy and and, and make people uh, raise their living standard. So it, it's very hard for them to 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 spend a lot of resources on uh, pollution control. But but once they, they reach some level, I guess, uh, with enough resources, as you say, uh, economic power, then they will uh, have to to address. Them. Uh, it's maybe at the more higher cost, but it 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 it, it, uh, it ha has often happened that way. Uh, it's fortunately, uh, it, I mean, China does a really does a keen sense right now the eco uh, ecological environmental quality of uh, paramount important from the top leadership to public. So that that that's really really a, a, a good thing, and the country willing to invest. Uh, much more heavily to fix uh, 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 pollution, environment, air, water, soil pollution, and, and to protect environment, environment better. And also, China is, is I think, is fortunate because there are a lot of valuable lessons uh, China can learn from developed countries, uh, environmental protection, like the U.S. or Japan or the world, Europe. In like uh, forty years ago, thirty years ago, a lot of lessons, you very helpful lessons, uh, and also on the have been significant in while uh, significant progress is te technological advances that we did not have 40 years ago, 30 years ago. So now China can tap into those uh, new advances, new technologies to help solve environmental uh, problems uh, and in a more sustainable way, maybe. Uh, um, so that sounds like you're fairly optimistic about uh, the, the future, uh, Chamao. I mean, considering your presentation to the Berzal Dreis uh, lecture more than maybe about 15 years ago about the, the water crisis in China, uh, you've seen a lot of changes over that time period. And, and so are you pretty optimistic about the future? And uh, you steer a lot of programs, you serve uh, lead roles in many of these huge programs. And so uh, you have a good vantage point to see how things are evolving. How do you see things going in the future? Yeah, uh, Bridget, thank you for bringing that up. But I, I, do, I did enjoy the lecture too a lot. And, and I, uh, I, I remember I, I, I concluded my uh, World China Run Out of Water uh, uh, talk lecture uh, with a quote from Charles Dickens. Uh, it's, uh, it was the best of time, it was the worst of time, right? So uh, 
I'm I, I I'm optimistic. I think I'm hopeful about the future. I think uh, China still faces a lot of uh, uh, huge challenges, in water challenges that we we just touch up a little bit today, and and, and uh, so well, it, it still uh, might run out of water actually in, in in many water scarce region in China. But the China, I think, has realized that. So, uh, so that uh, the the challenge. So, it's uh, willing to spend very significant uh, resources to address those. And so, I I I'm hopeful that uh, China has made a lot of progress, steady progress, and facing up to water environmental challenge over the last two decades. And I think it will continue. Uh, I think continue. So. Uh, to answer your question, yes, I'm optimistic. And personally, I'm doing the best I can to help. Uh, on a side note, also as a promotion, uh, I founded last year a new open access journal uh, called Sustainable Horizons. And with a focus on sustainability, including sustainable technology, sustainable health, sustainable environment, and sustainable management. And more than 200 professionals from over 30 countries have joined our advisory and editorial board. So international, I think, collaboration is really crucial to solving environmental sustainability and global change problems. I hope the new journal uh, serves as a bridge to deeper and stronger international collaborations. Right. Well, I would like to just thank you so much. Uh, our guest today was uh, Chong Ma Zheng, and uh, he is a director at Shenzhen Institute for Sustainable Development at SUSTEC, Southern University of Science and Technology, and is now helping develop a vice president at the new university, Eastern Institute of Technology in Ningbo. And I hope you will be very successful in developing a great university at Ningbo. And uh, I really appreciate uh, your talking about many of the different issues. And what I like about your work is the integration of all of the, you're not siloed. Your main focus has been groundwater in the past, but you're looking at the, the connections with surface water, upstream, downstream, and connections with other sectors. And also is the socio-hydrologic aspect connecting with stakeholders. And, uh, and then the governance aspect, trying to integrate these different government agencies and trying to push for that. So I wish you success in the future, uh, Jamal, and uh, really appreciate you taking the time to educate us today about the issues in China. Thank you, Bridget. I, I, you are my role model. I'm just learning from you. <laughs> yeah. yeah.